As we're learning tools for connected firmness, it can be helpful to have some foundational theory to hang those tools on. A little bit of the why. Why is it important to maintain connection with a young person to see their perspective when we're teaching new skills or correcting behavior? It's pretty ingrained in our culture that if we want to teach a young person new behavior, we have to give a consequence that hurts a little bit so that they get it. But this is actually counter to what we now know about our brains and how our brains operate. When we invite humiliation, disconnection, hurt, our brains actually can't store uh, learning in the memory in a way that's helpful. In Reimagining Resilience 1, we uh, learned a couple basic models of the brain. We looked at Dan Siegel's uh, brain in the palm of the hand model. And we also looked at this upside down triangle representation of the brain that we got from Dr. Bruce Perry's work. Our brain takes in all the sensory information from the world through the brainstem, what we see, hear, smell, as well as information from our bodies, temperature, heart rate changes, and the brain is processing all this information from the bottom up. As it processes, it's as if the brainstem's always assessing, asking, am I safe? The amygdala is always scanning, asking, am I cared for, connected? And our bodies are responding and acting on this information before the information even gets to the prefrontal cortex, where we're reflecting and thinking and asking, what am I learning? This is a stress response system. Our brain has a whole set of systems deciding what to do with that sensory and somatic input to keep us in balance, keep us alive. It's got a set of networks continually monitoring the world and a set of networks responding to that information. And this determines which parts of the brain are uh, more in charge, so to say. So if the answers are, yes, I'm safe, yes, I'm cared for, then the prefrontal cortex can have the majority of control over our functions, our actions. We can think about our options, our choices, access our creativity, see others' perspectives. But when we experience stress, when the answers are, no, I'm not safe, or no, I'm not cared for, then the lower parts of the brain keep more of the control functions and run the show. It's all about safety, survival response, memory and emotion, will act in ways that are more automatic, reactive. Depending on the situation and an individual's patterns of response to stress, this may look more like withdrawal, it may look like inattention, distraction, or it may look like a behavior we call defiance. And as adults, we typically see the behavior as coming from the prefrontal cortex. And we respond in a way that requires the prefrontal cortex. We wanna help. We have our perspective of what will help from up here, but their behavior is coming from down below. And so these are top-down solutions to bottom-up behaviors. So part of the connected in our connected firmness is meeting them down here to help them get regulated and connected, and then they can join us in problem solving. Taking care of ourselves is so important to even be able to see children's behavior through this lens. And then to get calm ourselves as we respond to young people. Our brain and our nervous system is the most important tool we have. If you remember when we talked about those mirror neurons in our last training, this is a great example of how certain processes in our brain and body are happening faster than our conscious thought. My nervous system can feel when other, other people's nervous systems are calm. As we're working with young people that have um, adverse childhood experiences and insecure attachment, a brain-informed approach to working with young people becomes an essential part of being trauma-informed or trauma-responsive because these are young people that have developed um, different stress response patterns um, for survival. We looked at this one way in our Reimagining Resilience One workshop using the concept of the resiliency window. We all have our ups and downs and our stress levels throughout the day as life happens, uh, but it's normal stress and we build resilience through these fluctuations in our nervous system. But when there has been toxic stress, 
excess or prolonged stress without enough adult buffering, one of the results can be a narrow resiliency window. Here's another way to look at this using our model of the brain again. Okay, so we have all of that data coming in through the brain stem and up the brain. As infants, we take it all in. We're seeing faces of our family and hearing voices and music and feeling cold and our stomach is rumbly. And we have no advanced way to process and make meaning and sort this information yet. As the brain develops, and matures and the prefrontal cortex grows, a feedback system develops that filters information and helps us know what to attend to, what to attune to. Adults are not aware of how much information they are sorting out all of the time. So right now you're sitting here and listening to me. You might also be checking your email or cooking dinner, but let's just say you're listening to me. You're probably not noticing how your feet feel inside of your socks right now, or how your feet feel where they touch the floor. But you can tune in there. You could tune into the feeling of the air as it leaves your nostrils. Or perhaps there's a fan or a, another sound in your environment that you had tuned out until I mentioned it now. So this ability to focus attention grows over time. And you'll see this when you um, are with a toddler, right? I went for a walk with uh, a friend's two-year-old and it took forever. You know, what's this? What's this? What's that sound? Noticing everything. It's like a mindfulness uh, walk. Um, and so as this develops, the brain is adaptive, right? So now imagine that you're in a home where the adult in that home has a narrow resiliency window and when they're flipped, they either dissociate and they're not available or maybe they act um, violently. You could see how it would become very important to pay attention to everything all the time, right? So you can have some warning and protect yourself. So then the brain is adapting. Don't filter anything out. It's unsafe. It's not conscious, it's not a choice. Um, it's not a damaged or deficient brain even, it's just an incredibly complex brain adapting in a way that makes sense for survival. So these feedback loops to filter data may be less developed in some of the young people we're working with. And from the outside, these kids can look like they have ADD, you know, impulse control, ODD, sensory integration problems, anxiety, etc. Here's another way to look at this. When our body is receiving all this outside data and responding, it's like a control tower for all the brain and body's functions. I'm sensing it's not safe. Engage muscle tension, raise heart rate, dilate pupils, shut down future thinking and digestion. We don't need those right now. And actually our whole brain and body are changing and there's a whole different state depending on our nervous system response. This graphic from Bruce Perry is a helpful visual to show how we experience different states and our capabilities are state dependent. As we get more stressed, as we move from calm to alert, alarm, fear, typically the heart rate goes up, but also our ability to think what we can attune to and how we think is impacted. Notice how our sense of time is completely different in different states. And students exposed to trauma often live in a heightened state of awareness. Again, a nervous system adaptation for safety. So when something stressful happens, it may push them from alert, where they regularly spend a lot of time, to alarm or fear. Now this is overly simplified. And if you'd like to know more, we've um, given you some links to Dr. Bruce Perry's work. He has a lot of videos that go into detail about these states and into the complex stress response patterns that young people exposed to trauma develop. For our purposes today, this is mainly another way to help remind ourselves that this is underneath many of those behaviors that challenge us, uh, from withdrawal to aggression. And these children didn't choose, you know, to have a nervous system that is in survival mode. It helps remind us that the best way we can support children 
uh, children's learning is to support them in moving left on this continuum, moving toward calm. We can't always know where young people are. That might not be um, the crucial thing, but knowing that we can help be aware of our own selves, moving ourselves toward calm, and then helping use uh, tools for young people to help uh, them move towards calm. You might remember this slide from our Laddership to Leadership video. We're looking at shared power and shared vision as a way of moving away from some of the institutional structures that have created inequities. I wanted to pull this in here because power impacts state. When we're interacting with another human that has more power or that we perceive to have more power, our body responds by heightening awareness, becoming more alert. It can take a whole different amount of self-regulation effort to stay present if the other is someone you perceive to have more power. We could easily uh, do a whole workshop just on this concept, but right now I just wanted to make this connection so that we have a bit of understanding that the tools we're offering for shared power also help young people to regulate. So many of you know a lot about this, you're experienced and you're doing this connection work with young people in your communities. You're buffering adults, seeing the young people's strengths and reflecting those strengths back to them. You're encouraging them. Human brains are always growing and developing new neural pathways and we learn through experience and through relationship. You're already helping young people build some of those foundational building blocks that we talked about in our last workshop. This is really just another way to look at some of those brain survival adaptations that we talked about today. So if you're in a state where thinking is more concrete or emotional, this impacts your causal thinking. And if you're in a state where the sense of time is hours, minutes, imagine trying to delay gratification for a class pizza party next month. So this is long-term work. And when a student gets mad and um, maybe someone calls them a name at recess and they withdraw or they get angry and, um, and act uh, with violence, we really want them to remember right, that lesson uh, where we talked about anger or where we talked about calming down or that lesson where we worked on eye messages. But we know that when we're in a more heightened state, we don't have access to that new learning. So it's important that we've practiced, you know, identifying the hurt cues in our body, our anger cues, practiced calming down from emotions, practiced eye messages, and practiced these over and over and over again until we've developed some new neural networks, till these things become more automatic, and then we'll have more access when in those heightened states. So this is building skills over time through relationship, through experience and practice. And sometimes with young people, this can feel really challenging. Maybe you've had the experience of feeling like there's a wall, or maybe you've had a young person that you've really built some connection with over time, and then they do something really big, really hurtful to push you away. Bruce Perry started to notice that the young people he worked with as a trauma specialist have a very different sense of connection. And it's a paradoxical response to connection because human beings are wired for connection. We long to connect. But some of these young people can't tolerate connections because they have this wired survival response that we've been talking about. And that survival response gets evoked around the sense of connection. So, for example, if one uh, grows up in an environment where the person they rely on, um, that they trust, that's meeting their needs, is actually um, angry when they have needs, then that survival response gets activated a lot. They get a lot of negative feedback from trying to connect, and it gets wired in. You'll see this with um, like preschool or kindergarten students who they're actually needy. They're like pulling on the teacher, 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 help me. And then when the teacher turns toward them with helpful intent, they lose it, right? So when they're in control, when they're asking for help, it's okay. But as soon as the control is with the adult, their nervous system just can't tolerate it. Um, and their body reacts with this stress response. 
So this makes it really hard to be calm in relationship, even if the relationship is friendly. Part of their body really wants connection, and another part of their nervous system is saying, no, not safe, don't do it. And this is, of course, out of the awareness, you know, of these young people. It invites shame. It's often really confusing for them. And it can be a vicious cycle. So we're going to discuss in our Zoom session, um, we're going to have some experiences together to really um, dig into this content and, and work together. But I'm going to leave you with just some of the big ideas um, about helpful responses. The power of co-regulation, really um, using those mirror neurons, calming ourselves down, perhaps noticing that urge to fix or our own typical top-down responses. Maybe we're leaning into permissive or authoritarian you know, in response to behaviors. So just coming back to our center, being present. We know that rhythm and relationship help regulation, so walking or movement together. Parallel walking and talking can be helpful. I found simple uh, call and response clap patterns, uh, really regulating and connecting for first graders that I was in community with. Present, patient, parallel, and persistent. Dr. Perry talks about these P's. So we've talked quite a bit about presence in our own body. But the patient, like being calm, moving really slow. Remembering that because a youth's nervous system is working really hard, it's going to take a while to regulate, to rearrange, to respond to our uh, prompts. Parallel. Removing eye contact, being parallel rather than um, direct, may be helpful. It may help to regulate. And then persistence goes with patients just over and over again, uh, stepping away and coming back listening, not just with our ears, but with our whole nervous system. We look forward to seeing you in our Zoom session together where we'll engage with some of these ideas together. There's also some reflections in your workbook for you to think about applications um, to your own work of this content, as well as links to Dr. Bruce Perry's work. Thanks for all you do to support the young people in your community. Your connection matters. It makes a difference.